Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Sarah Abos Jacobson, and I'm the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer here at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I'm going to turn this slightly because I'm also looking right into that light. OK. Um, and thank you for joining us for our 2023 Summer Survivor Speaker Series. And today is the first uh, in that series. You're going to be hearing from Dr. Andres Laco, or Andy, as he's known to his friends, who will share his experiences as a child in Hungary during the Holocaust. And I'd like to, before we go any further, give a shout out to three people in the audience today, his wife, who is here in attendance, his daughter, and his granddaughter. So it's good when the whole family can see him, can see him uh, talk. Before we begin, I would like to thank our community partners for the Spring Break Survivor Speaker Series, Attitudes and Attire, Green Hill School, Legacy Senior Communities, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, and the Texas Holocaust, Genocide, and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. And we're very grateful for their support and for the support uh, of the museum that they give us and also for our programs. I would also like to extend a special welcome to our board members, members, and volunteers in the audience. We couldn't fulfill our mission without you. If you are interested in becoming a museum member or volunteer, please visit our website at dhhrm.org to learn more. In just a moment, Dr. Lacko will share his story with you. Then we will have time for questions and answers. If you are joining us in person today, you received a card and a pencil, one of those little golf pencils when you came in. Please feel free during the course of uh, Andy's talk to write down any questions you might have. And our staff will come around toward the end of his uh, remarks and collect those. And we will get through as many of those as we can with him. If you're joining us virtually, please use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen and type out and submit your questions. And we will get to those as well. It is now my uh, pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Laka. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to check this pointer. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the Holocaust in Hungary. And uh, of course, I'm supposed to tell you my personal story, which is included in that context. And in a way, <clears throat> when you read about the Holocaust, unless you read a special publication, the Holocaust in Hungary is not publicized especially, even though they have some very unique features, just like my personal story. So please feel free to interrupt me, even though there are questions. If you have an urgent need to ask a question, I'd be happy to try to answer, even if it's in the middle of the presentation. So this is uh, giving you an idea of where Hungary is. And I'm going to give you a couple of pointers about the significance of this. Uh, this is the map of Hungary. And uh, it's in southeastern Europe surrounded by countries. Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. Of course, there is a war in Ukraine that's going on up here. And uh, so Hungary has always been in the middle of a lot of turmoil throughout its over 1,000 year history. And uh, just to put it in context with regard to the Second World War, the Germans, the German army went through this area and occupied actually a good part of Russia, which is the east of here. And then after the Battle of Stalingrad and a number of other events, the Red Army started pushing the Germans back. And they were pushing them back right through Hungary. That was, Hungary ended up being part and a major part of the uh, theater of war at the time. 
And that is uh, that I ended up in the middle of, as you will hear in uh, a few minutes. Hungary actually had a unique position among many other countries that you hear about by survivors because Hungary was actually an ally in Germany as opposed to being the enemy, part of the allied group that of course also included the United States after 1941. The only other country in this area was Romania, and Romania quit considerably before Hungary. Hungary stuck with the Germans almost all the way to the end, and uh, this is where problems really begin for the Jewish population of Hungary. So this was just by way of introduction. I'm going to give you a few personal details. You see me on the left uh, at the age of approximately one year. And of course, uh, responsible for my birth or in the middle of my parents, two years before my birth. They were married in 1934. And to the far right, there is a gathering of my mother's family that was right before they actually got married. Interestingly, even though we were extremely fortunate during the Holocaust to have very few relatives that we lost, but on this picture, the person whose head is barely visible on the left, unfortunately, my mother's uncle he never made it back, and his daughter right here, the two of them, were the ones who were lost from among all these people, which again uh, is remarkable compared to the rest of the Hungarian population, where over 70% were lost of the Hungarian Jewish population. I'll give you some reason as to why the discrepancy between our family and the rest of the population. <clears throat> but this gives you a little view of uh, what our family looked like. And there you see me in uh, kindergarten in a devil's costume, which is probably a very appropriate costume considering my behavior at the time. And of course, there are some friends and eventually classmates. You see me here beginning my musical career. Since then I switched to the piano where I do a little better. But, uh, uh, and here is a little demonstration of my devilish uh, character messing around with the radio, which I was only allowed to do because they were taking a picture. Otherwise they wouldn't let me 10 feet near that radio. So. Uh, this uh, is a timetable of uh, our experience and the experience, of course, the rest of the Jewish population in Hungary. March, I oh, apologize for that. March 1944 uh, was the time, March 19, 1944, actually, where the German government got fed up with uh, the Hungarian government, even though Hungary, as I mentioned, was an ally of Germany. And the Hungarian government representatives are negotiating with the British government as to how they might avoid uh, having the country destroyed and being defeated, and they were trying to seek a separate peace. And once the Germans uh, got hold of this information, they uh, invaded Hungary. And this is one event I remember quite well. Even though I was only seven years old, my parents uh, and I were coming out of a movie theater, and uh, the theater happened to be on one of the main streets. And as we come off, we saw all the German army vehicles, tanks, and, tra and, and troop transporters going by, and we knew that uh, 
our future is not going to be very pleasant for the next several months or years, and hopefully not for a long period of time. The uh, <clears throat> next picture on the lower left shows the rounding up of uh, Jewish population. And that is actually in the capital city of Hungary where I was born and lived. And I will show you the map in a minute and give you the significance of living in the capital city versus the outlying areas and what it meant in terms of survival and the opportunity to survive. The color picture is uh, an apartment building which was about 100 yards from another apartment building where I was born. And uh, the uh, picture that you see uh, of a building is where a family gathered because the Jewish population was ordered to move into special houses and special apartments and eventually into the ghetto area, which I always, I will show you as well. So basically we ended up in a two bedroom apartment where my mother's aunt and uncle and my second cousin lived, which was a very nice apartment, but we ended up uh, being 18 people because uh, all branches of our family moved in there. And this, of course, was, even though not quite as crowded as some people had to endure, it was certainly different from our earlier living conditions. So the point I'm trying to make is that even though, uh, as you saw the earlier pictures, uh, including me next to the radio, we had a relatively comfortable middle-class life, and also a relatively safe life, even though the Hungarian government imposed laws and regulations on the Jewish population until March 1944, when the Germans actually came in, the real problems began only at that time, because that meant the beginning of the rounding up of people taking them into concentration camps, loading them into the uh, cattle cars that you saw, one of them upstairs if you were visiting the, medium, the, the museum, and eventually transportation of concentration camps in what is now the uh, territory of Poland into concentration camps or death camps such as Auschwitz and Birkenau and places like that. So this is what uh, this particular diagram is trying to convey to you, is what happened in such a brief uh, period of time. Actually, uh, the last date, October 15, 1944, even though it didn't mean a liberation of Hungary or the end of the atrocities against the Jewish population. Between June and October, the Germans managed to actually exterminate 600,000 Jews from Hungary, which was the fastest pace of uh, killing during uh, all of the Holocaust. And this was an amazing feat because the Germans actually were getting shorter rolling stock, transporting their troops and armaments. And yet, <clears throat> the uh, officers and uh, officials, including uh, somebody's name you might have heard of, Adolf Eichmann, managed to accomplish an extremely efficient transportation and elimination of a large part of the Jewish population. So this is actually something that I'll come back in a minute, but let me show you this map first, which kind of explain why things happened the way they happened and what actually were the consequences. So 
You see the map of Hungary and the little dots you see are synagogues or Jewish settlements throughout the country. And the arrow points to uh, the capital city, Budapest, which had uh, about a million uh, inhabitants uh, and about 150,000 Jews who were living there at the time. And clearly, the people who lived in the outlying areas, except for the capital city, were very much exposed and in very much danger of being very quickly rounded up and deported and very likely killed as well. And uh, up here, if you wonder what this is all about, this is an area where there was a rather dense Jewish population. And this was a special sect of Orthodox Jews who actually, um, a number of them managed to escape to the United States. And they actually had their own little town in uh, New York State. But this is just an aside. Back to the point I'm trying to make, the population that was away from the capital city was in great danger of being harmed and very likely killed. And this is where over 70% of the Jewish population uh, of the whole country was exterminated. Uh, the outlying areas were probably eliminated to the extent of 90%. On the other hand, in our family, less than 10% of losses occurred, which was a tremendous blessing that we were protected because of our location in the capital city as well as the way some of us had an opportunity to, ex to actually avoid uh, these problems. And some of these I'll go into a little more detail. So now I'm going to switch back and show you this. This is my father's certificate. <clears throat> he was serving in a work group that was assisted the Hungarian army that suffered tremendous losses. In, uh, in about 1941-42, mostly where Ukraine is located today, Fortunately, my father was never taken there, and he actually survived. He was only in eastern Hungary, but what you see here is his identification papers for his group. This is the way I looked like at that time, uh, at the age of uh, seven, and this is my mother, considerably less well-dressed and outfitted compared to her wedding picture. This is the way she looked when she had to go into hiding with false papers and claimed that she was actually a Christian. Her great-great-grandmother was actually a Christian lady who converted to Judaism. So she had some features uh, like blonde hair and blue eyes that uh, enhanced her chances of being able to survive under these circumstances. And actually she did, and thank God we were all joined, rejoined uh, after the war. So I'll get into some of those details as well. Now, I told you about the last date here was October 15 on the far right side. And that is when the Hungarian government was actually forced to give up all power over the country because the German army came in with their troops and uh, the Hungarian government ceased to exist. Instead, a far right and viciously uh, cruel group of Hungarian fascists similar to the, the Nazi brown shirts uh, took over. And they consisted of a lot of teenagers who were running around with uh, submachine guns. And they really liked the idea of how much power they had over the Jewish population. And they, instead of taking 
putting people into the cattle cars and taking them into uh, places like Auschwitz. They take them down to the Danube, line them up, and actually shot them in the water. We actually knew a lady once, uh, myself as well as my parents ended up in Canada, and she was, she was taken off to the water. It turns out she was a very good swimmer, so she jumped ahead of the bullets and she survived, but very few other people did. And even though this was a much less efficient way of killing people compared to shipping them up to the death camps, uh, the, this Hungarian fascist group, by the way, whose descendants uh, still have seats in the Hungarian parliament today, and they occupy about 20% of the seats. Just to give you an idea of uh, what the state of anti-Semitism uh, uh, might be today. But I don't mean to digress. I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, so, this is the next phase that I've already mentioned and I talked about. And what you see here is the uh, camps where the, most of the killing of Jews, especially Hungarian Jews, took place, which was uh, in uh, Auschwitz or in Polish. It's called Oswiecim because now, of course, this area is all part of the country of uh, Poland. So it gives, it gives you, again, a, a little bit of geographic uh, orientation and, of course, shows you the relatively short distance, even though it took over a day, sometimes two days, to transport people from here to here, it was still quite feasible. And as I mentioned earlier, well over 600,000 Hungarian uh, Jews were killed in a very short period of time, only uh, about the, the span of six weeks. So now <clears throat> we are going to approach uh, what is my personal story. And uh, as I mentioned, my mother went into hiding. My father was away at some other place. And I was actually uh, taken to a Jewish orphanage. As it turns out, after about a week, that place folded. And I was taken to a roundup place where they were getting ready to transport people into the ghetto. And this is... Uh, the picture of the entrance to the Budapest ghetto. And uh, this is how they started in other countries to get people into a very small area and then deport them. With uh, us, of course, it happened only at the very end. And conditions were really very poor in this ghetto. And this was a relatively small area where they tried to squeeze in a tremendous number of people. My, st my personal story at this point turned out to be an extremely fortunate uh, uh, set of events. Uh, when we were waiting at this roundup place, I actually met my grandparents there. I was sleeping in a china cabinet with a friend of mine. Uh, and I could only sleep by having my legs drawn up because uh, it was only about this wide. So at that place, people were waiting to be transported into the ghetto. In the meantime, I contracted a very serious contagious disease called scarlet fever. And uh, along with two teenagers, we were put into a room because this disease, again, was highly contagious. And this Hungarian fascist who came into the building to get everybody ready to go, they didn't even want to open the door where we were because they were so afraid that they are going to also contract this disease. 
So instead of taking to being taken to the ghetto, I was taken to this hospital, which is still the main building of a large complex of a medical center that was built since. And this was, uh, at that time, a very state-of-the-art and very nice hospital where I was uh, taken along with a number of soldiers of the Hungarian army and treated just like they were and given three very good meals a day. In other words, I turned out to be uh, in a very fortunate position for about a period of six weeks until the Russian Red Army reached the hospital. And then, of course, another journey began. <clears throat> so while most of the Jewish population of Budapest ended up taken to this ghetto area, which was a very bad place because of the crowding and lack of food and poor medical care. There was also the plans for this, since there was no longer an option to take people to the death camps or concentration camps. The plan was to surround this ghetto area with explosives and blow it up altogether. Thank God this not, did not materialize because the Russian army beat the Germans to the punch. And even though people were living there under very poor conditions, they of course, for the most part, survived. At the same time, as I mentioned to you, I was in a much better position, in a very fortunate position, being able to stay in this hospital where I was taken care of and I didn't have to go through any of the suffering that a lot of other people did. So this uh, a picture of the fight for Budapest between the Russian Red Army and the German forces, and this turned out to be a very bitter struggle. Uh, the uh, Red Army actually lined up artillery and they were going to blow the city to smithereens. But for some reason, they changed their minds and they let the uh, foot soldiers actually do their work, just like it's shown in the picture. But it took actually several weeks for the city to be taken. And even then, they only took the east side of the city, which is the Pest part of Budapest. The Buddha part, which is on, across the river uh, on the west side, took another several weeks. <clears throat> so point being, there was better fighting going on for the fate of the city. This is uh, my story as far as navigating the uh, various traumatic conditions that uh, actually uh, prevailed at that time. The, uh, the series of arrows shows my journey from the hospital, which was on the outskirts of town, back to where our neighborhood was, which is where I lived. In the meantime, just to show you what the conditions were in the city, this is a royal palace which was just about blown to smithereens. If you want to visit Hungary, since then it's been restored and it's beautiful, so it's no longer like that. The same is true for the bridges. There were seven bridges across the Danube which were all blown by the Germans to slow down the progress of the Russian army. These have also been rebuilt and things look a lot better now. But at the time when I was taking this journey, things looked just very, very bad, and there was a lot of damage and destruction as the fighting was going on. So you may ask, why did I have to take this journey? Why couldn't I stay in the hospital? Well, as it turned out, the patients, including myself, 
One day found ourselves in the hospital without food or even water because the staff all left because they were afraid of the Russian army coming in and, you know, whatever they might do to the people in the hospital. So everybody left. One day we woke up and we were there. So two teenagers and myself, I was seven years old at the time. Well, I was already eight, actually. And uh, we decided to walk home. This is uh, about a 10-mile journey. Took me about five days. The other boys dropped off along the way. One lived about here, the other one lived about there. And uh, I ended up, uh, the, last ver the last section, walking on my own. Uh, this journey was not a pleasant one. As a matter of fact, by the time I got here, I developed a very bad case of dysentery. I was very weak, and I was taken in by a young couple, and they kept me for three days and nursed me back to hell, gave me food and They actually uh, told me, as I left them, that if I cannot find my parents, please come back and we'll adopt you. Well, thank God that did not have to happen. I ended up uh, over here where we used to live, and uh, I was still lying in the basement of one of the uh, houses where a lady lived who used to do uh, cleaning of our apartment and the wash. And the next day my mother showed up and she was, of course, beside herself. She already went all the way to the hospital looking for me. She couldn't find me. But uh, she somehow found out that that's where I was taken. And uh, so our family got uh, back together. So. This was uh, my story as far as uh, the Holocaust. And uh, you may ask, how did I get here? Well, at the age of uh, 18, this is what I looked like. This is my personal uh, identification certificate, which I still have in my possession. And what you see is the stamp of the Canadian Immigration Authorities, which is where I ended up in January 1957. Again, through a series of very fortunate events, I was transported by air from Vienna to Montreal, which was a rare privilege because I was already a university student. And a lot of the uh, refugees from Hungary ended up staying in the refugee camps in Europe as long as a year and a half after this. But uh, I was transported within a week or so after I signed the papers with the Canadian government. The, uh, on the right you see the briefcase which held all my possessions when I left Hungary. And now it's in the possession of my youngest uh, grandchild and uh, I gave it to her, so she has a feel for uh, where our family came from and where we are today, which, thank God, is a lot in a lot better position. Uh, my wife and daughter and granddaughter, as Sarah mentioned, are in the audience, and they are certainly having more possessions than what we fit into uh, briefcase, but that's just to give you final of the story. So this is my journey from uh, Europe to Canada and eventually United States, and I, there were a number of stops along the way, and it would take another couple of hours to give you all the details, so I'm not going to go into that now. But this is what I looked like on the streets of Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where I ended up in Canada, and I went to university there. 
After that, I went to University of Washington to get my doctorate and eventually ended up uh, at the University of North Texas Health Science Center, where I retired from uh, a year and a half ago. So what about the consequences of the Holocaust? Well, as you can see, our family has grown a lot. This is a family reunion at Possum Kingdom Lake. And certainly, uh, we were blessed with a very substantial growth of our family. And this is my granddaughter, who is in the audience right now. And this is the youngest granddaughter, who has the briefcase. And this lady is living in South Carolina right now. This is my niece, uh, my uncle's daughter. This picture represents another branch of our family in Sweden. This is my second cousin who emigrated there. Her husband just died last week, as a matter of fact. He was 94. And this is her daughter and her son, and, and they are all very, very successful. So why am I showing you this picture? Well. As far as I know, none of these people, except for my wife and myself, are actually really, uh, ha really have kept to the Jewish religion. As a matter of fact, I've undergone ups and downs as far as believing what I was or what I am and what I'm not. And the Holocaust didn't leave any of us without a trace of its impact. But thank God we are healthy for the most part and we are doing well enough that everybody has a good lives to look forward to. So that's really the end of my presentation. I would be glad to try to answer any questions that you may have. And Sarah is coming down to coordinate this process. Okay, thank you so much, Andy. Um, hold on, this is popping out here. There we go. Um, so. This first question uh, is from Zoom, so it's from somebody who's watching you virtually. And the question is, do you know how your mother was able to save family photos while in hiding? Well, um, that's a very good question, and it uh, extends into another issue. Uh, the... Uh, Apartment where we moved, where these uh, photos were, I presume, were left intact. And this is the apartment where the large family group moved, like 18 of us into a two-bedroom apartment. And somehow, eventually, when we got our own apartment again, uh, uh, we managed to move all that. However, a very significant amount of our possessions were given to people for what you might call safekeeping. Unfortunately, this was not a very safe place to put our possessions, even though it included uh, my father's several suits, a lot of clothing, a lot of household possessions that the people reported to us after the war that uh, the Russians came and took it away. In other words, there was nothing left. I mean, my parents had to start everything from scratch, including almost all our possessions and uh, my father's business as well. Um, the next question is, did the hospital staff know you were Jewish? And did they treat you any differently? 
To tell you the truth, I don't know for sure, but uh, it would have been almost impossible not to know. And they treated us quite well. We were not discriminated. Uh, next question. What was your best memory and your worst memory from the war? <laughs> well, some of you might have seen the Italian movie called Life is Wonderful. And there, I think, a three- or four-year-old child lived through the Holocaust, very much protected by his father. Well, I had nobody protect me all the way to the end, but frankly, I also treated the whole affair as a game. It, it wasn't a good experience, but uh, I managed. And uh, I guess the best experience was the beginning of taking uh, piano lessons. I had a wonderful teacher. Unfortunately, she didn't make it. She, she did uh, die in one of the death camps. And uh, that provided me with some enthusiasm for music. But as I say, I couldn't continue taking lessons from her. I had to change. But that was something that I enjoyed doing, and that was during that time. Do you remember anything about your personal experience during the Soviet Army siege of Budapest? Uh, I have a very interesting sideline you may <laughs> not enjoy necessarily, but appreciate. Along the journey, which was shown by the uh, consecutive arrows, the collection of arrows on my journey from the hospital back to our neighborhood, uh, we actually uh, stopped at a factory that used to make tractors. And in the basement of this factory, we took refuge because there was fighting going on, very heavy fighting. And uh, I just put down a bag which had my possessions, like a pair of pajamas and a couple of shirts that I managed to save, and I put it on the bench next to me. And a bunch of Red Army soldiers came and put, put one of the comrades right on top of my possessions. And this soldier was bleeding like crazy, so all my possessions at that point were gone. And of course, uh, that was not as important as saving the life of the soldier, but I, I couldn't do anything about that. But at least you have an idea that we're right in the middle of where this was all happening. When did you first arrive in North America, and can you describe a bit more of your journey? Journey from? From Europe to, to Canada. Well, the journey, well, I, have, I arrived in the United States in 1963. I went, went to University of Washington to do graduate studies. But the journey occurred in uh, 1957. I mentioned to you that I was flown from Vienna to Montreal. And then from Montreal, we were taken by train to the West Coast in Vancouver, which is where I settled and lived for seven years. Then I came to Seattle. I was there for four and a half years. And then uh, I lived amongst other places in New York, in Philadelphia, and then eventually came to Texas. The stay in New York was brief. It was only a year and a half. And Pennsylvania, I lived for six years, and then I've been here in Texas since 1975, which is, uh, uh, what, uh, 23, so it's 60, uh, no, 75, so that would be uh, 48 years, 47 years, something.
Canada, how you were able to, just a glimpse of how you were able to go from being a refugee with well, nothing. Well, okay. Thanks, Annette. That, uh, that's a good point. <laughs> and that may be worth mentioning. Uh, it's good to have your family around. You know. <laughs> uh, I um, got to Canada and, and uh, to Vancouver, and I decided I'll do whatever it takes. And that's what I had to do. My first job was a messenger boy delivering uh, parcels and letters on a bicycle for 85 cents an hour, which was below minimum wage even that time. Then I got a little better job packing up uh, ladies' garments for a dollar an hour, but somehow I had the courage to enter University of British Columbia in the fall of 1958, and uh, since then, I've been what you call an academic. Uh, I don't know whether this is in sufficient details or what you're referring to, I but. Think, I think that's a piece of it. I think it's important. I mean, how much English did you know when you got there? How OK, you well, uh, I actually, in Hungary, you may be interested to know, by 1949, the only language that was taught in schools was Russian. Up to that point, I learned a little bit of English from a private tutor. And because I was doing well in Russian, they allowed me to take a bonus course in English, which I did for a couple of years. And then my mother, of course, being the type of person she was, she again got me a tutor to learn more English. So I got to the point of actually translating Shakespeare. But when I actually got out of Hungary, and I remember this very distinctly, uh, I told you we were flown from Vienna to Montreal. That actually took four legs. We went from uh, Vienna to Scotland, from Scotland to North of Canada, from north of Canada, we had another hop and then to Montreal. But in Scotland, I remember distinctly, we, uh, they came to serve us lunch. And I asked in English from the waiters if I could have a small spoon to eat my soup with. But that was a struggle even for me to put a sentence together. In other words, I could translate things with a dictionary, but I couldn't really speak fluently. And as a matter of fact, in the fall of 1958, when I was trying to enroll at the University of British Columbia, I failed the English test. And somehow, the Dean of Agriculture gave me a second hearing, and he drew up a set of courses, and I, I was going to start in the second year because I had one year credit, supposedly, from Hungary. And those courses, he said, if I pass these courses, then I can move on. But if I don't pass every one of the courses, I have to go back and start with the first year. And thank God, I managed to pass. And uh, the summer of uh, 1959, I got a job in Summerland, British Columbia, where I was put into a room with a young gentleman who was five years younger than I was, but still a university student, who was born in the north of England. And that summer, I could speak nothing but English. And ever since then, I've been doing better. So that. Uh, next question is, what did you study in school? And they, and they said, why did you want to be a doctor? I think they mean, why did you want to get your doctorate? OK, well, I'm not a medical doctor. I got a doctorate in biochemistry. And that's what I wanted to study, actually. And uh, that's what I was teaching at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. 
where I'm still engaged to some extent. So, short answer, biochemistry. And what drew you to that? Well, what drew me to that is uh, a number of books I read when I was uh, 9, 10, 11 years old and, and later. And again, this could be a long story, but I'm going to try to cut it short. In Hungary, under the communist regime, it was not a free pass to go to whatever high school you wanted to go. And I wanted to study chemistry, and they told me, forget it, because my parents had a store, and they were capitalists, and that was not going to go. Somehow, I managed to enroll in a high school of, of the food industry where I was taught, amongst others, by three PhDs, in areas, mathematics, chemistry, and biology, which was a tremendous benefit to feed my curiosity and arouse my interest to further studies in that direction. And that's how I ended up in biochemistry. Andy, how did you meet your wife? Well, that's another story may take longer. Well, Terry, who is sitting in the audience, is my second wife. The mother of my children, uh, I married earlier and we divorced in 1981. After, actually, in the fall of 1981, by that time, I recovered some of my hang ups about my Jewish identity and I actually uh, ended up. Uh, looking for the ad in the uh, Texas Jewish Post where they had an advertisement about meeting of the Dallas Jewish Singles Group. And I went to the first meeting that I found. It turns out I was giving some lectures in Fort Worth and I drove over here and the first person I talked to was my wife. and. Uh, and that was the end of that. <laughs> okay. Um, what, uh, when were you reunited with your mother, and how were you reunited with your mother? No, my mother just came looking for me, like I mentioned, at the hospital. She couldn't find me, so she went back to the neighborhood, and then the word got around that I was already there. So she came down to the basement of the house, and that's when we were reunited. Um, two more questions. Uh, question one, has Hungary made any formal apologies to the people displaced by their actions when they sided with the Germans during that time? Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary Dr. Viktor Orban is a very vocal fellow, and he has done some good things, but he's done some bad things as well. And one of them is that he is a denier of Hungary doing anything wrong during the Holocaust to the extent possible. Now, there are some monuments, like those shoes by the uh, Bank of the Daniel showing, you know, what happened. But as far as individuals, he's been actually shielding a lot of those. And this is uh, a sad development that happened during this regime. Okay, final question. Why did you decide to start sharing your story? And what is the message that you hope to give to the audiences with whom you share your story? Well, uh, I shared my story the first time uh, because, again, of my mother's activities. Uh, she was a very outgoing person, and she accomplished quite a bit as a result. She lived in Vancouver, and uh, 
there was some place where she was, I think it was a Jewish community center, she was playing bridge. And, and they were told that uh, the uh, foundation that was funded by Steven Spielberg, the, the Holocaust uh, Foundation at University of Southern California were gonna come around and they're gonna do interviews. Well, it turns out I was just visiting Vancouver that week when she was interviewed and they immediately jumped on the opportunity that they got two for the price of one in the same apartment. So that was the first time and that was a very substantial interview. It lasted over an hour and a half. And I found that perhaps that had some value and then I was asked while we lived in Fort Worth a number of times to give talks to schools. I've been coming over to the museum's yearly uh, charity dinner and I was talking to people uh, like Julie Berman and others and she always told me, why don't you do this, why don't you do this? And we just moved to Dallas a year and a half ago and now it became logistically a much easier opportunity to get involved. And I've given now five or six lectures in the last couple of months, so. So uh, I should explain, Julie Berman, who, who uh, Andy just mentioned, is the daughter of two uh, Holocaust survivors, <laughs> both from Hungary, one of whom was in the labor brigades and became a partisan, so a, a resistance fighter, and the other of whom uh, survived Auschwitz. and. Um, Julie will be speaking two weeks from now, uh, it, um, and she will be speaking about her parents' story. So I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us this this uh, afternoon, not for the spring Survivor Se Speaker Series, as I had said, but the summer Survivor Speaker Series, because it is hot out there. Um, and uh, I hope that this was worthwhile for you, and I want to thank uh, Andy, as always, for sharing his experiences and his memories and his life with us. Thank you so much.